forget the brief for an hour or two. Your primary job as a designer is to get yourself in the state of mind that you can create. You have to enable yourself to do your best work. Yeah. And that that goes without saying that needs to be because your clients provide you uh, with the time and the resources and you have to provide them with good quality designs. Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm Britton Stepetic, and this is Low Key Legends, the show where I sit down with creative legends to fish out nuggets of wisdom that you can take away on your creative journey. Today, I am joined across the screen by Mario Shimich. Mario is a senior digital designer at Born Fight Studio, and he's way too humble to admit that he belongs here on this show. And by the end of it, you will understand why. You have to check out Born Fight's work, but Mario, my Croatian brother from another mother, how are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe that I'm a little bit more low key than a legend, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I chose this name, one, because it wasn't taken, but also I think that the low key nature is more about the conversation and the energy and the perspectives of the people because if someone was just like a straight up asshole, I probably wouldn't have them on the show, no matter how famous they were and or important to the design industry. I would just want someone who's a good guest, a good vibe and wants to share a perspective and knowledge about their own journey. And I truly do believe that everyone has something to teach from their own life. And we'll probably get into a ton of that. Yeah, thank you very much. Looking forward to that. I thought it might be an interesting place to start because you didn't start directly as a designer and you have this background in IT and engineering. And I'm curious how your background in engineering helps you as a designer in your day-to-day -day workflow. And if there's any kind of correlation between how you think between those two different realms, between kind of engineering and design. And I'm also curious your perspective, if you think that all designers should try and pick up code or all developers should try to design. And maybe we can figure out <laughs> if there's one method that's better than the other. Should designers code, right? <laughs> that's age old question. Yeah, well, um, if I forget something, feel free to repeat me the question. But basically, uh, when I started out, uh, my role uh, in my career, basically, I started as an IT IT guy, and uh, my my entire education resided on the uh, you know computers and you know the uh, how how to use them properly, how to connect them into the networks, how to program some stuff, and that basically. Uh, launch me into a career where I could apply those, that knowledge as easy as possible. Turn, turned out that that's that is the web technology. Mm. So uh, so uh, but when back when I started, uh, most of the people who were studying in uh, design that that wasn't a, a really focused role, if if that makes sense. Because uh, my first job actually included for me to call to know how to code the front-end development stuff and uh, and try to you know bring the vision from the initial sketches the initial design and uh, go through the code and then bring it to life um so that that is very really, really challenging but then again back then uh, the websites weren't uh, were not so much um uh, uh complex i would like to say uh, because, you know, if you're doing some, because I believe that everybody was working in such a hybrid role and uh, being in a, a fixed role, which is very focused, uh, was kind of considered a privilege because mm -hmm. creation IT scene wasn't uh, like very developed back then. And, uh, you know, it, it it paid off to have some flexibility and uh, like a wider pool of knowledge to, to go with that. Um, when... And there is a little caveat, caveat that when you try to, you know, work like a, a front-end developer and designer, uh, it's like very, it's like a psychology thing because you try to draw something, but you already think how you will code this, for example, mm -hmm. some, some time later. And uh, it's very uh, easy to fall into a trap to make it uh, too easy for yourself and uh, get, get something, you know, because it's not like, 
I was I will, I believe a lot for a long time. Oh my god, this is the laziness. I cannot do this. I mean, I like I will be uh, like very uh, I will be done really quickly if I do this this way instead of this way. So, uh, but but no, yeah. Um, I tried to push myself as hard as possible, uh, but and that was uh, uh, pretty much the time that uh, responsive design was coming in, in like mm. a huge. Uh, Kind of showing my age here a little bit, but basically what means is, is we had to switch our workflows a little bit, so that uh, so that added another dimension to my you know the the front end development component of my career, right? And uh, I always, uh, but I always had uh, like a burning desire to try to uh, focus on design as much as possible, and this was the the phase that i cared so much at a certain point that i actually actually sucked at it really <laughs> as i was overthinking it uh and you know i can draw this and i can go through all of these iterations and see how it's something can work but man you should you should be able to code this so i have to scrap half of my ideas and go to go to actual production um so yeah that was very really interesting um but yeah, and then later uh, when I switched, uh, I, I started to this small studio where I had that um, hybrid role. And then I joined um, eStudio, which is basically uh, today's uh, Borofi studio. If you count, uh, we have a very complicated past, but basically uh, what we uh, what have done, uh, I had a chance to uh, actually specialize a little bit into a realm of design. But even as I joined the company, the second company, so back then it was called eStudio, it was very, um, my role was still hybrid because I, I joined the actual uh, product uh, design role back then. And I was also almost exclusively focused on that. Uh, I worked on the two products, but basically uh, I did some coding and designing back then also. And later stage, we had a like another division that was doing the agency work. So the classic agency work we always uh, where it's also familiar to us. And uh, that was kind of you know refreshing experience for me because it wasn't like very stale work. It, it was always dynamic and everything else. So. Uh, I decided to specialize in that. Mm. Um, that being said, it all that kind of engineering part, engineering part always, always stays with you because uh, at least at least uh, you know the lingo when you're talking about developers. At least you can you know provide even some solutions when I mean uh, two heads are always smarter than one. So yeah, yeah. and uh, sometimes uh, in the same way uh, when. A uh, technical person can give you some kind of design advice. Uh, the same applies in the other way, also. So I I believe that that's a good thing to you know know something. You don't have to specialize it, but if you know the lingo, you, you lingo. If you have some background, uh, I like to say if you done this for money, like professionally, you have like pretty much good knowledge back then. Of course, mm. this is outdated as fuck. I mean, I mean. I couldn't code for shit these days, but uh, it's very uh, interesting because you can look at the project more holistically. Uh, nowadays, uh, when I design stuff, I try to make it as complicated as possible because <laughs> I know that my colleagues kind of hate me. But then again, they will uh, push their boundaries, and uh, you know they're specializing in their part of the job, so that kind of enjoyable for them on some kind of weird level as well. <laughs> But should designers code or should uh, technical uh, should technical people try to design? I think it, it doesn't doesn't have to be professionally. Um, but it's kind of it's kind of interesting thought exercise uh, exercise because you can actually uh, get some more empathy from the other side if mm -hmm. you're in shoes, and if they were in your shoes also. Definitely, uh, I would say should should people go? You sh you should try. I mean, there are a lot of no code solutions these days, so you can go into that really easily. Uh, but it does require some of the, you know, HTML, CSF fundamentals and stuff like that uh, to, you know, what's a class, what's an ID, what's mm -hmm. what, what, you know, what, what, what markup means uh, and everything else. Because, you know, 
if we have a history and started like a documents and then we tacked on some interactivity that our, our, our whole profession is a big like hack. <laughs> I don't know how we managed to do this and earn money these days doing that, but uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you should try it. You should definitely try it. Yeah, I I did a little back in the back in the day, back in the 2010s, but it's not what I'm great at. But it would be fun to kind of just like dabble in it, just to again, I think the the sense of empathy and kind of relating to the the developer that you're working with. And and I agree, two heads are better than one. So if you come at it with a this idea, this teamwork of empathy that you're achieving something together, I think you can truly shine when you're working in tandem and not adversarial, like, why the fuck can't the developer do this? Or why the fuck does the designer make everything so complicated? When you're collaborating with that, uh, with that in mind and with that empathy, uh, that actually enables us to evolve in our specialized roles. So uh, first of all, when we started, you were like, just like, I'm a web designer, which is not wrong these days to say also, but nobody uses that because it's not flashy enough. But basically we are, <laughs> most, of us, most of us are web designers. Uh, but uh, when you're doing uh, a certain type of projects, which are very interactive and very uh, uh, high concept stuff, uh, which is, you know, maybe has some unusual conventions broken and everything. Um, you can evolve, okay, I'm now a digital designer or whatever. I design for screens, I design for interactions. And our developers uh, who, are, who are doing the front-end uh, stuff, they are not like front-end developers, they're now creative developers. And that's where we actually, you know, it's like very accepted term in the industry now, yeah. where you have a, like a, 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 a front-end developer or a developer in general who has an act for visual or for interaction. Mm -hmm. And you also have like a, a designer who knows the lingo, can help out, but can focus on the storytelling and, you know, the overall message that we try to convey. Because everybody that is doing the same job, towards the same goal, we're just using the different methods. There must have been something in your childhood or something that sparked this kind of creative, I guess, like identity within you that led to you wanting to make that transition to being a designer more so than a engineer or a developer doing the front end. So I'm curious what kind of sparked that interest in you because it, I mean, when I look at your work, I'm like, you have a designer's eye. Everything is like meticulously laid out. It's like beautiful. It's creative at the same time. And I can say like, maybe some of the best work, is coming out of Croatia. So, I mean, anyone who hasn't seen Born Fight Studios work, you have to check it out for sure. Where did this kind of like visual knack come from? So my mom is a, is a tailor. So I, I believe that some of that is very genetical. Mm. So, you know, some affinities that she has and everything. Uh, because, you know, she was making the, uh, the clothing, but she always tried to put some twists on it. Um, she And even today, she's now very closely to, you know, close to retirement, but she has this, uh, she has uh, her own, like, DIY uh, workshop, oh, yeah. doing a lot of stuff, you know, uh, Christmas decorations, uh, all, she's, she paints a little bit and everything else. So it's very interesting. So probably that had, a, like, significant influence on me but uh in terms of like the you know the parts of my childhood that sparked i don't know i was always interested in computers i always knew that i would uh, work with the computers with computers in some way i didn't know what 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 would that way be mm -hmm. but uh it was kind of cool because when i when i actually had a like my initial contact with uh, uh, with the design and an aesthetic aesthetic which is which is kind of the way okay I could reproduce this do something that all came from the books uh, I mean sorry the the games mm. and the uh, the movies mm. specifically sci-fi uh, sci-fi movies and shows I ju I'm just uh, these days I'm uh, I'm rewatching the uh, Star Trek Voyager oh nice and yeah 
and I totally remembered that they they even that this is so old of the show that have they even had like four by three uh, aspect ratio. It doesn't feel it doesn't fit on my my white screen TV. It's so funny, but uh, I always you know um, I got inspired from these kind of stuff. You know the the weird stories, the weird uh, everything uh, design. You know all the, it, it, it was always the combination of technology and everything else. So uh, for the longest time, I thought I was going to be a a painter. Maybe uh, I would do some art stuff or graphic design stuff. Uh, I kind of quit from the painting, but because believe it or not, uh, I suck at drawing. <laughs> I cannot draw a straight line for the for the life of me. I, it's it's really clear. I mean, my handwriting is terrible, uh, and and everything I do with my hands, as long as it's like. Uh, filtered by computer, it's nice, but everything else is so, <laughs> it's, it's terrible. Uh, but yeah, um, basically, uh, games, games, and uh, and TV, uh, it was kind of you know. And then I started when I when I went to school. It was the time when uh, uh, my mates from the from the class were having like uh, when you know the the generations of cell phones back then were like very dramatic. Today oh, you yeah. can tell. The, the, you can't tell the difference between iPhone 12 or 14 or whatever, whatever, you know. And uh, and we have like at the dawn of the uh, full color uh, mm -hmm. display cell phone, and this was really very small. Like I I can't even remember its solutions, but I remember that some uh, people had like uh, an option to have an animated uh, GIF wallpaper. And I was making those in Photoshop frame by frame and selling them uh, to those peeps. And they were like, they were like, showing off because it actually had their name on it and everything else. You, you could you could do it really custom. So they could, they got the service from that. So it was like an animation, and it, it was very custom. I usually it said something in terms of I'm number one or something like that. And then my signature and everything else. It's very cheesy now that I think about it. Was yeah. that a sort of business selling gift wallpapers? No, not really. No, <laughs> but. <laughs> I get. Uh, I got. Uh, I did manage to get a lunch or two out of it. Out of nice. that money. But, worth uh, it. Yeah, but worth. Birth, I mean, that was like my pocket money. That was great back then. But uh, what actually attracted me to do this is to you know, really like to you know you draw you draw something, but it's kind of nice to is to see people how do they use it. Yeah. So I knew I knew that I would like to make something. That is not like the the poster or something like that. It has to be interactive. It, it has to provide some kind of delight. It has to provide a reaction to your action. So that's why I kind of you know went to to, to that uh, direction and uh, and deciding to be designer as opposed to uh, engineer actually came back really pretty late in my. Uh, actually, pretty recently, if you would think about it, uh, given the fact, like it's like I don't know, let's say that uh, I have like 10 to 10, 12 years of uh, of professional career. So doing this for money, three or four was spent on the actual, you know, coding and everything else. So that's kind of, in that regard, is pretty recent. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. But the motivation is the same. I, I like to do some interactive animations and the lights and everything else. So it definitely shows. I mean, uh, we're gonna jump around all over the place here, but I mean, I think one thing that I've noticed from from you in particular is that maybe even the the BFS team, and that's Born Fight Studio. So I may shorten it for the audience out there, but um, yes. um is that it, there's this emphasis on passion projects and creation, and we can get into the, the culture and philosophy of BFS naturally here, but I think it ties to you as well specifically. I mean, it seems like you always have something cooked up. Like the, I think the most recent thing I saw was like this reframe like project that you have, like as like a little side hustle that you created. But um, I guess like, what what sparks kind of your general curiosity, your desire to make 
uh, while you're not at work as well. It, are we just both workaholics and we like to make things on the side? Or <laughs> I guess, where does that come in for you as well as how does that connect to the greater goals of Born Fight Studio? We try to make sure that we have a like pretty decent work-life balance if you know if if projects permit so uh, I, I used to be a workaholic i'm not gonna lie and i worked myself to that because sorry about that i was um very uh my my goal to matter to do something now is to spend uh, a lot of time to on that mm -hmm. and that was my goal to method i wasn't trying to be smarter with my time i wasn't trying to be i don't know uh, try to be lazy, find some shortcuts and everything. And part of, part of that still remains with me, but um, kind of, you know, you at certain point you kind of grow up and you, you need to see that not uh, that your life consists of more than just work and you have to be you know, smart. So that kind of makes you to, you know, think about, about design and work in a little bit different light. Um, but uh, that being said, we always try to, I mean, uh, most of the people, and that is actually part of our legacy in Borofar Studio, because for for that, I will have to explain you a little bit of history. Because, yeah. Um, so when I joined the, the E-Studio back then, so E-Studio, uh, it was uh, renamed uh, and rebranded as The Guardian. The Guardian was the full service uh production and advertising agency, basically. So we did a lot of, you know, advertising campaigns. Uh, we, done, uh, we did a lot of uh, social media management. We have teams for that. Um, uh, that company still exists, but we are separated now. Um, and the production part, so the people who were making, you know, that what you mentioned. So uh, we were making the apps, we were making uh, websites, uh, we were making um, digital products, so tools in the cloud, something like that. Uh, that was kind of the production part, which after a while split into its own entity, uh, which was named Warfight. Mm. So, we, so it, it was kind of a running theme in the company uh, because every time we grew a lot. So at, at that time, we had, I don't know, we, if we had... I'm gonna lie. My my CEO is gonna kill me because I'm spitting wrong numbers here. But uh, I think we we were like uh, in the in the hundred and possibly fifty to eighty people. Uh huh. Some somewhere thereabouts. And uh, this is like our magical number where we actually split into two different entities, so you can retain that agility and some specialization, specialization and everything. And uh, that split was basically from uh, like the Gordian at like a group mm -hmm. pace to the Gordian and Boar fight. And, uh, and we're, when we're talking about board, the Boar fight, of course, we actually evolved into in uh, our like own sandbox. And uh, Boar fight is now specialized. Well, we started as a production, you know, the production uh, agency, basically it's this agency. But uh, we had a few clients that were uh, steer our projects into the product uh, direction. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we have like that internal organization, which was working uh, like in specialized services. For example, we are going to do only web applications. The other, uh, we call it those divisions. The other divisions uh, would uh, work only on, uh, for example, uh, web web applications, web uh, websites, and third one would be uh, making the uh, you know mobile apps and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that was like that that magic tree, or that we actually mm -hmm. managed to cover in that. And of course, one of that is basically the web division, which is now spun out into its own thing as we grow, as we reshuffle and everything. And this is now what it's called the Bonafide Studio or BFS. Uh, so we had a like very um, branched development from our company. And uh, basically all that, all that time, even from the very, very beginning, uh, we had that culture uh, in design, especially at some point we had like, I don't know, we had like 10 designers. It's like, it was a very large team too for that company hyper productive, highly creative, uh, very performance uh, peeps. I mean, 
some of the best designers in the world are basically those people I had the honor to work with, uh, which, you know, many, you know, when we shared those experiences, that was very nice. But we uh, always want to do like awards type of work. Mm -hmm. So that was our benchmark. So when we, when we, uh, when we were talking about some award winning stuff, we were all, we were always talk, talking about, okay, how we can win this, how we can uh, make this as this agency. So, and you research some of these agencies, oh, these guys are already established in our industry. So maybe we can uh, see you, how do they work? How many people do they have? What are, what are their specialties and everything else? And uh, yeah, that uh, it was very strong culture, and uh, for a long uh, for a long time, our whole company was. Now that's my perception; could be a little bit wrong, but it was it was reliant a lot of uh, to it was very reliant on design. Design mm. was very strong, so we tried to be the best in our country. Then we tried to be best in our region, pretty much. And then we try to be best in the Europe, try to be best in the world. And you know, you know, you try to you try to push yourself. We didn't succeed every time, of course, but it's like that ambition that is basically very, um, very, very driving and a very cool force that you can rely on to you know uh, to to create some some of that work. So yeah, that's that's kind of always it always was in our DNA, more or less. So I and I actually grew as a professional in that environment. I am so grateful to have that because man, there's no challenge you can throw to to our team that we cannot solve. I mean, it's really uh, and back then when even when we were younger, that's that kind of naivety and stupidity. Uh, there was not there was not. Uh, like a situation where you could say, "Oh my God, we don't have literal knowledge to do to do this project. We cannot do this. We know we don't know how to communicate with this type of people." I mean, some kind of startup goes to you, and there's a ten people. Yeah, we can do that. But if it's like a hundred million dollars on the line, people are like raising uh, um, investment for this, and you try to help them. I'm like, this is very different area. It's like. Very <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, it's becoming serious. It's a long way from my animated GIFs uh, on mm -hmm. the cell phones and everything. It seems like yeah. there's like a internal culture that it, that you guys have built about like pushing and pushing. You said like trying to be the best in the region and then mm -hmm. like the world. And I mean that guys uh, that that methodology pushed you to the point where you became Studio of the Year on awards and eventually grew so much that you split into Born Fight Studio as a little sub-branch. I am curious um, how much connection to Born Fight and the kind of intermixing is there in kind of like the studio goals? Do you guys have your own particular goals and are pushing for certain things and certain amount of growth and trying to do like X number of projects or um, do you kind of like have like separate division heads or how does that sort of work? Yeah. So, uh, so basically now uh, how Bornified is uh, organized now I'm talking about the Bornified. So it's like the parents of mm -hmm. our company, our studio, uh, they're basically now, and I haven't mentioned this before, they are in the business of venture building. Oh, this, okay. This means that basically, um, they have like two core teams which they can, you know, provide uh, to people with ideas. Mm. And, we, uh, we, and actually, uh, Borofad helps them to, you know, build the company from the ground up with uh, uh, already, you know, already a very good team and they know each other and they work uh, a bit more efficiently than you, as, as opposed to trying to hire everybody from scratch. It's kind of a cool approach. Um, and in the and of course we have some you know financial goals that we need to you know uh, reach of course yeah. because but those goals uh, and my CEO will try to probably correct me on that but basically you know, we try to uh, have as much as autonomy as possible and we do have autonomy as possible so nobody 
gets tangled in our strategy, our marketing mm -hmm. efforts, and everything else. Uh, our goal is always to make money, get recognition, and try to bring back, be present in the community, basically. Uh, so we, our goal is kind of you know, go profitable because if you're profitable, it means that you will have more time. If you have more time, you will get like more high quality uh, projects out of your out of your fingers, and that will give you awards. We will give you recognition. It kind of sounds egotistical, but it's a recognition for you know we're doing we're in the right right path in our like profession. We we try to do the right thing. We try to you know. Um, push as hard as possible in terms of quality and everything else. So yeah, that's kind of the the interesting thing about that. So it's kind of a unique relationship because we are a studio and we are bootstrapped, but we are not as so much like dependent uh, on our parent company, but we still have like loose connections with them. That's, that's kind of it, yeah. And uh, I, I remember you said something about the culture or- the, Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it like the culture that I guess is perceived from the outside in at Born Fight Studio is that there's this sense of like self-driving, this motivation to do passion projects, to put out great work, to experiment and test. And that is present on the website as well as just... Um, I guess your continued team's use and your continued use of like sharing on Dribble as well as like Twitter and social media. And is that a, just a part of the culture at BFS or is that driven by any one individual at the company? I, and how much of that is your just self initiation versus like incentivized by the studio? It's kind of half half kind of situation. So you have the you have the ideas and you have the capability to put some uh, nice conceptual work, which is outside the client work, of course. And uh, that's something that it allows you to flex your creative muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, we always tried uh, back in the day. The we uh, most of these projects were self initiated, and uh, we were working them in our spare time. Which is kind of you know it's uh, it's okay when you're a little bit younger, you're not married, you don't have children, and everything else, but it does kind of you know serve the purpose of getting you better in a better place as a professional. So that that kind of makes sense, and I'm not regretting regretting one hour of that. Mm. Uh, but today, uh, what we try to do is make it as a part of the marketing effort in general. So as we, and when we're talking about the uh, to when you, when we are talking about the uh, presence in the community, we do have some kind of marketing budget. We have marketing time, and uh, we have like designers who can you know let's we have like several tactics that we can employ. For example, if we uh, if 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 we have a for example a project that just launched, okay, let's put out the promo for that. But if we don't have anything. At the moment, or the projects are very, for example, um, long. So you can have the period when you actually don't launch anything, mm -hmm. and it comes like five projects you launch within a one month period. So that's crazy. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we try to do concepts. Mm -hmm. So, if, if, for example, if you are like a designer in our company, you will get okay. This is like um, you will have a certain part of the week just for you. And you just do your thing, uh, try to make it as, uh, for example, lately we are trying to focus on e-commerce a little bit more. So try to make it something really related to e-commerce and just put the, the fuck out of this. Uh, you know, <laughs> try to make it as wild as possible. And uh, within, of course, that time constraint and everything else. So that's kind of the hybrid way. And, uh, and I think that nobody is like uh forced to do this uh, but uh, it's kind of cool because on your company time you can actually get the the peace and quiet that you require to you know push your best work with conceptual stuff experimentation mm. something that can be used for later we try to we try not to uh just 
put up the, the shot on dribble or the behance or LinkedIn, whatever, like X and everything else. And we try to uh, learn from that, put it in our like pattern library, try to reuse it, try to see, because everything of uh, all of those things are pretty much useful at a later date. If yeah. you, then, I mean, that's obvious, but not a lot of people actually do that. So it does have a value when you actually invest your own time, as long as it keeps, you can actually keep that and, you know, actually use it for something cool because i i like the, i like the moment when you have a client and you just meet a client you barely know their name and you, and you barely know their their colors so you just went from there like uh briefing or whatnot and you have like that one element that <laughs> in your mind i'm gonna use this right now not, i don't care what everybody says i'm gonna assist on this and uh you can you know you can you can create the art direction for the website within like few hours literally you can get a feeling for that in a few hours maybe you cannot actually produce the home page for example yeah you can get a, a really rough idea and get a vision of what you're trying to do and that's the most fun part for me is to do that research uh inspire myself from the wild oaks of sources uh from music from pinterest from uh from the games and life in general photography whatnot and that's kind of cool uh because uh it keeps you refresh so yeah that's kind of nice and in the same time you're you're actually very fast having projects outside of just your standard work projects one influence your future work projects but it seems that there is like moments where on a project, a person can get stuck. And I find that that's usually the case when you've hit like some sort of like level of either boredom or you've just like worked on it for too long and you need something like fresh or new. I'm curious your uh, method or if you have any tips for kind of not being stuck on a project in your creative workflow, but I guess like having that outlet to just do whatever you want to experiment is like a good place to start to kind of get out of a creative funk. Mm -hmm. But I'll let you take it from here and talk about if there's anything that you do in your workflow. When I was starting this company, there was a quote from my mentor. Uh, he always said that basically you should, uh, as a designer, you should work on two things. You should work on your taste mm. and you should work on your hard skills. Mm. And uh, if those two things are really out of balance, you will end up chasing your taste. And uh, if your taste is very good, but your hard skills don't match, you will get stuck because everything yeah. you do won't be good enough because your taste is better than that. Mm -hmm. so you and you can always always uh, argue in a different so uh, in inverse order if you have very good uh, uh very good hard skills but you're just good in one that thing you're not accepting some kind of other uh like uh inspiration and your your work can become stale it can be good it could be correct but it can be very stale so you have you have to keep that engine running in terms of you know to avoid being stuck mm. uh, for me um and it's not like a bulletproof solution no, it's like <laughs> so everybody gets stuck sometimes but it's a kind of cool uh, method that will, you can help yourself so ideally you can help yourself like if you're all your own there's one one method that we can use another method if you're working in a team you can always try to ask for help from your team just you know ask a designer for an hour or two of their time Come on, peeps, let's just, you know, do some research, do some uh, fresh perspectives, try to, you know, unblock you from that mental, you know, rut that you were stuck in. And uh, more often than not, that helps a lot. Uh, we conduct uh, in, the, in the studio, we conduct twice a week, we have those creative reviews. Mm. Basically, a uh, glorified version of a stand-up or, uh, or uh, I don't know, just like a team meet where we actually... Talk, talk about and showing our work and we'll and we are commenting uh, with the feedback it's not very structured because it's like very it's a, it's a small team so we know each other very well so we yeah you know but basically 
it's a point of getting fresh perspective. Even even you feel you're doing fine on a project, you can always learn something new. You can always someone will really, will be inspired by your stuff, so they can draw another section. Or, for example, uh, I need some more references from the I don't know from the various uh, spots on the internet and everything else. So yeah, that's that's kind of the team team part. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, when you're when you're on your own, and that will happen if you're doing some side some side projects, or you just to come some freelance work, and you don't have that luxury, it's kind of cool thing to. Uh, what I try to do is to forget the brief for an hour or two. So let's just you know. I know that we're looking working for the client, but your primary job as a designer is to get yourself in a state of mind that you can create. You have to enable yourself to do your best work. Yeah. And that that goes without saying that needs to be because your clients provide you uh, with the time and the resources, and you have to provide them good quality design. So it's your responsibility as a designer to achieve that. Whatever whatever you need, just try to. Achieve. So for some people, it's like. Uh, walk around the neighborhood, something like that. Uh, for me, I prefer to you know stay with that, stay with the design, and try to you know play a little bit. Uh, okay, so for example, we have a we had a project when we uh, it's very it was very strictly defined. So it was like we have a bunch of uh, guidelines. Uh, we have a, like uh, low attack. It must be uh, like you you. Whenever you put it on a uh, on an artboard, you're already wrong. So it's like mm -hmm. very in that in that way. So we have a very uh, very comprehensive set of restrictions, and you were like, Jesus, can I design something that you haven't touched? But you don't have any examples, so you have to create those examples. So worst from both worlds. Um, uh, so I tried to forget the brief for an hour or two and just try to play, and I will, I try to. How do I see that company? How do I see that topic? How do I see that brand? And usually that consists of going uh, going to the Pinterest. I have a Pinterest set up with a, a lot of stuff and it, like algorithm is crazy on Pinterest. I don't know. I know that a lot of people use Pinterest and it's not very, uh, some, sometimes people say it's not very popular due to, uh, you know, like it's always going to the same thing. It's very, it's like the yeah. same stuff. But then again, Pinterest has a really cool thing. I don't know how many people are actually using this. I just go into a related spree. I call this a related spree, which I actually pick a design, which basically roughly goes in the direction I would like to go. And I don't close that. I just save this reference, but I go to the related stuff and I pick the second best thing. And I pick the second best thing. And what happens is that that sometimes it can maintain you in a uh, same style, but sometimes you can deviate a little bit mm -hmm. and have some kind of a deviation that actually introduces a little bit more spice into your work. Because, uh, for example, I always end up on uh, some weird uh, meme stuff or uh, technological stuff or uh, uh, Hollywood interfaces or uh, whatever. I mean, it's very it's very wild because. Uh, you're not inhibited by brief at that point. Yeah. And if, of course, you cannot transfer those ideas directly to the client because those restrictions still apply. But when you have like that session by yourself and you have the vision and you can, you know, it's easier to create uninhibited and put that, you know, the pick, you can pick and choose those references and see how you can apply those into your work. Then than trying to create from scratch, but with the restrictions of mind. It's it's easier to like break the idea down than to come up with a idea with restrictions. Mm. That, that's quite, so I try to go uh, the other way around, basically in that process, and uh, that's kind of you know the cool thing. Uh, and even I even have like uh, you mentioned reframed. I even have like whole philosophy, the the, the whole side project that basically deals uh, in this and this alone. Is to how uh, our references, how uh, the inspiration actually can affect your work. Uh, what I found is, um, you know, you go to the Pinterest, for example, or you go to the Behance. You have a, you see an awesome case on Behance. 
And you can see the process. You can, okay, these are typography stuff. You can see the sitemap. You can see the art direction for the photos. You can see the layouts. You can see a whole bunch of stuff. But all of these are results of iterations and inspirations that you are you're not able you're not able to see. That yeah. process is not transparent. And as much as as much as people like to you know showcase this like a very fast time lapse, and you know I make this really quick. So the Instagram is full of those. You can see, I mean, obviously, but these are very 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 prepared, and very curated, and very fake, if I may say so. <laughs> so um, so I, what, I, what I actually made, I made a website, which was, uh, it's called reframe.online. It's a website that basically studies the connection between inspiration and your final output. And you can actually see the lines, the influences from the, your like mood board and how that reflect, how was that reflected in the final design? Uh, I should probably do the better job updating that website, uh, it, it, because if, like it's like pain of the side projects of course <laughs> but then again i uh, i think it's very useful for uh, and especially i think it's very useful for the junior web designers uh because uh most most of the, them don't know exactly how to conduct research what is good what is not and they don't know exactly how what to look in uh, in the mood board sometimes the Certain only certain layout will inspire you, but colors are all wrong. Or, for example, the fact photography is awesome, but the layout is like obnoxious or like <laughs> I don't know. And uh, I, I try to know when I have those references, I try to actually capture those with okay, this is a cool grid. Forget the colors, this is a cool grid. Uh, yeah, this is typography, this is a cool uh, this, cool that, cool that, and you can actually trace those into the final work and the final work and most people uh, feel that if you can see actually uh, influences it will seem like um, as a not original mm. but basically if you combine a lot of the because everything is like influenced by something else so you you cannot run from that it says on the website true creativity is a myth i stand by it i'm gonna die on this hill <laughs> true creativity is a myth uh, everybody's influenced by something and uh, we should try to make this process as conscious as possible. And this is not forbidden word or this is not something. And, and everybody is like, you know, it's like a matter of pride for designers to hide their references, hide their resources, hide their... Everybody's trying to be, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, you know, release this animation to the public and share my <laughs> Yeah, sure, nice, that's cool, but show me your process, man. Show me your way of thinking and you know for sure show me where you fucked up a lot of designers get like very protective and then especially in this web design community and they're like oh so and so copied you it's it's like oh i didn't know that you owned the shape square and i didn't know that the color red was yours did you originate that color and patent it oh thanks great it's not a copy. It looks totally different. You just did something similar because there's only so many ideas and everything is connected. And they could have looked at something that was entirely different than your website and came up with a solution that is very similar. Like not everyone is a thief. There's things that just like end up being similar in nature. Yeah. yeah and I guess like that's a whole different topic entirely is like, we're all influenced by trends and what is contemporary and what is cool right now. And then it's just, I think you have to be aware of that as well as being aware of like your individual taste and making mm -hmm. sure that they're kind of in alignment with each other, that you're creating things that are like intentionally new or maybe unintentionally new by putting it through your specific filter of like what you like and why you like it and all sorts of different references to create, I guess like unique things. But I think there's something interesting in there with like the process of, of creating versus consuming. Is there amount of looking at Pinterest that is unhealthy and demoralizing and kind of uh, can inhibit a designer, whether young or old, and then we just need to get to work and start creating things. 
what is the balance that you think should we create more than we consume i was always chronic consumer so yeah i was always leaning to that side because it's so easy to look at somebody else's work so uh, somebody else's vision or something like that and when you get to you know you pick up your you know your pen or like uh, your uh, figma file and you try to draw something that sucks that can be really deliberate mm. and uh, i don't know i haven't i try to move myself from the from the mindset of being like looking for the right balance the right balance is something that you is very individual yeah so it's something that will and you you can the best way to assess that balance is to when you try to create do you have some resistance do you have something some negative thoughts in terms of okay this really sucks but my last 10 projects sucked also what am i doing with my life so yeah like it's an existential crisis but uh that means that you're just consuming too much it's not like it's not a disease it's not like you, you're not stupid or you're not like uh uncreative or something like that you just need to um put shitty stuff out mm. clear, to clear that out of your system maybe it's not shit after all sometimes you get a new perspective uh but yeah we can uh it's it's better to you know act on this uh it's it won't be a pleasant thing but you shouldn't you know if, if i'm for example if i'm giving you for a younger designer uh, some kind of advice i always try to say them they shouldn't put too much pressure on themselves in that regards uh because uh it needs to be a fun process it needs to come from you it needs to be you have to be intrinsically motivated uh to do the best work because um if you're compelled in any other way it's like i i kind of feel it's it's short-lived uh it can it can burn you out that that can burn you out for example if you're just influenced by some outside factors money uh cell cell phone uh i mean sense of self-esteem or something else it, it that, that those are not good drivers but if you find it interesting if you find it fun uh you can actually learn to make make it fun for yourself that's kind of the the thing because everybody is thinking okay uh but I'm already, you know, in that mindset, I have to do good work, but I don't actually enjoy it. Okay, just take a break. Try to make something, um, try to make something for you. Try to make something for you. And that's pretty much something that can charge you up. Yeah. Um, so when we talked about the some, some kind of ratio, you, um, unfortunately, everybody has to figure out uh, for themselves. Uh, I always try to act as much as possible on my uh, blockers. So when I start to work on some kind of project, if I see, if I see that uh, things are not going well, if I'm not, for example, if not, I'm not feeling the emotion towards my design, I always try to, you know, re reframe myself into some kind of different perspective or try to, I don't know, forget brief, for example, or watch a show watch something else we have to stimulate yourself in some other way just to keep yourself out from that rut that you you're having and uh, even as, yeah, if that doesn't work you just have to power through and try and work put that shit out shitty you, you can delete the figma file later if you want that's <laughs> if you hate it uh but uh you have to you know experiment a little bit and try to remember why do you like this job <laughs> and because it's kind of cool because i always try to when i when i lose myself from time to time because deadlines on the are insane for example or i don't know I, we have to put us some launch something very quickly or i don't know what i try to remember that okay we're doing this for money and that's perfectly fine you have to put the two food on the table keep the lights on perfectly fine but then again uh try to introduce some sparks it won't be a grand masterpiece or something like that but it will have a piece of your personality there Definitely. and uh you, you i always try to find those moments i don't make, succeed every time i'm not some kind of idealist and you know try to sell you some kind of unrealistic story it it can suck but it can be very very rewarding and cool and from time to time you get a project when you actually click with a client these guys, you know, see your portfolio and say, Jesus, guys, you're, you're fucking amazing. 
you, what do we need to do? How we, how we can make this happen? And like, watch what you said, man. Watch what you said. <laughs> Take you through the grinder. I'm gonna make you write the content. I'm gonna make you hire a photographer. He'll do everything for you. And you will be satisfied. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, definitely. Uh, you have to find a balance for yourself. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and it's uh, and be being okay with your work suck a little because over time it will grow. You you cannot be uh, your your current. Uh, project cannot be uh, it's not realistic to, to, to have it like better than the last one it will have its own ups and downs but on the average you will grow and mm -hmm. that's like end of life nobody if you have a capability of retaining information and learning this will happen it's not it's not even talent it's like put put the work down and try yeah. to see it works definitely yeah. effort and it seems like the more that you just like practice and make things the more your taste shifts and in kind of like weaves around like you become interested in some things and then like maybe two months later it changes and then you find like you look back at old work and you're like oh that's that's not nearly as bad as i thought it was or you're like oh okay i've gotten a lot better so either way it's kind of a win and i guess like a note on like going back full circle to when work isn't fun I found that like, I notice I'm not having fun in my work when two things are happening. So I've identified if I'm comparing myself to other people, whether designers or studios, I okay. don't have fun in the work because it it's a, it's just caught up in the comparison trap. I'm like, this isn't as good as them because of X reasons and thus I suck. And then it starts like a spiral. And I think one thing is we have to get ourselves out of that because whether someone or not is better than you is a totally relative thing that you're creating in your imagination. Exactly. Uh, maybe they make great work that looks different from yours, but they also have a different perspective. Maybe they're an entirely different culture. So if you're in Croatia and I'm in America, we have totally different cultures, even though we may also be immersed in the same things. You love Star Trek, I love Star Trek. We both love the same music, but our upbringings are different. Our perspectives are thus different. We're different people, different right. ages. So all of that has a play in the work that we're making. So I think that's what one place that I'm like, oh, just turn your brain off. Like you had said earlier, like forget the brief, turn your brain off, just make some shit, have some fun. And then it yeah. becomes kind of fun again. The other thing that I've noticed is um, is when I'm just like overly busy or stressed, like I just don't give a shit about like the work. I'm just trying to like get through it. And that's also like a mindset to also think about and like step back and analyze and be in the moment and just try and focus on one thing at a time. I think that stress is difficult and it's something that will all deal with for the rest of our lives but how do we focus on the present moment the present task and just put our effort into that knowing that once you get some things done you're going to get the task cleared out maybe you can even ask for help if like you have a team and, and to balance out that work so you can try to get back to the place of fun and if that doesn't work maybe we just need to like you know take a break or hang out with yeah. some yeah, the, the stress can make you switch context a lot. Uh, yeah. I can actually see myself in that sentence because, uh, for example, uh, and it's especially true if I forget uh, forget to have enough sleep or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Just, I try to, I, I become like, uh, my, mind, my mind is being taken over by a monkey and I try to do whatever that monkey says. Mm -hmm. And it's like, some of those things are useful, but some of those things are not useful at all. I mean, Jesus, why do why are you checking out the cat videos on Instagram? <laughs> I, I, I try to reframe myself. I try yeah. to you know your perspective. That's a lie, and you know it. Uh, yeah, but uh, definitely, and I uh, definitely can see your point of, about um, uh, comparing yourself. We always have like that. I mean, I think it's natural for for a human race in general that we we always see something as a competition, or for example, yeah. that's why we play sports. That's that's basically it. But when you actually realize that this is a lie, that 
there is no competition. There is room for a lot of people. And uh, who who is to say who, who will be design judge for that? For example, uh, if you're making websites, I'm making web applications or uh, I don't know installations. How we can pick, compare those two? Even mm -hmm. with even and even within a web design community or yeah. visual community, it's very hard to hard to um, compare that because. Uh, you have different clients, you have different goals, uh, the culture that you mentioned, the, the upbringing and anything else. It can provide a lot of, you know, different context, mm -hmm. you know, how you approach the, the, the project. So, yeah. And uh, definitely uh, what you said about the, sometimes not giving a shit can be helpful. I know, I know it's like a weird thing, but I have like that mode. I just need to get through this. I just need to get through this. I just forget about it. Make some shit. It will be shitty. It will be fine. And you, when you come back, this will not bother you, and you can improve it. But you have mm -hmm. to get it out of the system. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I I know everybody's like, I'm very meticulous and perfectionist. <laughs> and I don't know. It's sure, sure, that's that's healthy attitude uh, to some extent, but sometimes it's not, it's not man i mean you're mm -hmm. you're like, a lot of mental resources that you're spending and if you burn them out uh it will it will have it will take some time to regain them again so you know take care of your shit take care of your mental health take care of your body um is this these are these are basics for me i try to work out my new 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 year resolution is to work out this year a little bit more mm -hmm. and I, see huge 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 difference just for the sake of the mental clarity yeah it's, it's huge for me um especially if you have the time you know man go and invest 15 minutes of your precious uh work time and try to do something for your body and uh, get some uh, nice fresh uh, nutritious food in your system and uh, you know you can you know you you can put the gas in the tank but mm -hmm. if you don't gas in the tank the car won't run it's, it's so true yeah so yeah definitely so there's a lot of that that i had to encounter during my career is to i compare myself a lot a lot i mean that was like very cancerous for me and then uh, um i just figured out you know by the shit i have to i have to remember why i'm doing this and uh when i actually remembered when i uh, try to you know play games and uh, read books, uh, see the shows and everything else. That kind of puts me into some kind of different mind state of mind because I, uh, in the same way, I can feel the creativity from those people whose content I'm consuming, including yours, for example. It's like very. Um, by the way, this this podcast is like killing. Me. <laughs> 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 to say this because. Uh, it's it's like it's it's like amazing. Uh, oh, because, thank you. I just uh, I would go through. Uh, I would switch the topics a little bit because I just remember our conversation last time you know, when I mentioned. Uh, well, I wasn't actually sure if I can live up with all the design celebrities on this podcast, and you were such uh, like a we had hand wavy attitude. Yeah, yeah, I started with my things. So I'm editing this by myself. It's so cool. Next thing you know, a guy has a like Claude Bouglieri on his uh, podcast. Like, come on, man! <laughs> but, oh, sure. And uh, that that's that was kind of cool. So um, I mean, but that's also also the way that you can actually um, break away from the rut because we're not doing the design now. We're talking about design. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we can be a smart about it, but everybody else's stuff. But we don't have to be constrained by it. We can, we cannot, you know, it, do, it doesn't have to be this way because you set the rules. If yeah. you if you want to judge yourself, I have refused to judge myself. And, and, that, and then you can let your talent, your hard work sh uh, shine and everything works out and people start to notice, oh, okay, you came, you were really free in your work. Yes, I did. That's, that's kind of cool feeling. Thank you for that. But yeah, yeah, that's what the, uh, don't compare yourself too much and work out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. If I honestly, that that's like maybe the biggest takeaways that anyone could grab is don't compare yourself. Just do what is exciting to you. 
And I, I do think that perfectionism is an excuse for just not pushing publish in a way where it, it's just being too precious about something that in the long run doesn't matter. You just, mm -hmm. just put out the work because once you do, you're going to be on to the next thing and you're going to grow and learn from it, the experience. But if you hoard it like a dragon or a miser, like Scrooge in a way, then you're never going to learn from the act of you know, submitting it to public or peer review. And it doesn't even necessarily need like people to give you feedback in like that context, but just like having it be out in the ether is like proof of where you came from and to where you're going in the future in, in a way. But um, I can uh, actually add to that a little bit. Uh, it's very, you know, keeping those things published, mm -hmm. pressing the publish, but keeping that on your profile, it's very important. You, mm -hmm. can, you can see how far you've gone. Yeah, and, uh, I, I have a like a mentorship session for uh, one of the young designer in our, our company. Um, I I said to her that basically, uh, yes, we can practice design. I always have like a mentorship session with her, with, where she, where I uh, we have a like um, assignment where she has she has to pick a website. She needs to reproduce it like to a T, like Ooh. copy, it. and. Um, and uh, after that, she has to create something original. Mm, mm -hmm. Copy this, don't publish it. This is just for you. I mean, that's stealing basically very much. But uh, on the a, on a second part, uh, try to create something out of that. Yeah. And she will go through that cycle. And I am for also forcing her to, okay, you have to publish your shit. Now you have to publish. Oh, this is not so good. Yeah. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Imagine, imagine how good will it be 10 uh, Instagram posts from now. Mm -hmm. like, you have this like shot, it's kind of montage or whatever. And you like 10 shots later, if you don't uh, have, if you don't see improvement, I mean, that's that basically that's impossible. Agreed. So, so yeah, so you have to keep your, you have to keep your shit. Don't park, don't delete. Just keep your shit <laughs> on your profile. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's, no, that's so true. That's, that's, yeah. I was going to say, I think mentorship is also a huge opportunity and an, another way to even get out of a creative rut. If you have to translate ideas to the younger, the younger version of yourself, mm -hmm. I mean, it one, it solidifies the lessons that you've learned along the way and it forces you to clarify those messages and teach someone in a way that it'll stick for them. And so I think that is totally, totally valuable. And there's this, there's this boxing idea. Uh, maybe it applies to sports in general, but I, I learned about it through a boxing analogy. But boxers always have someone that they're equal with in their weight class that they're fighting against they try to have someone they're mentoring or teaching and there's always someone higher up so that in, in sports there's always like a champion or a, a winner but especially in boxing there's like the the person that you're trying to beat like the champion so having that so you're training against people that are on your same tier or scale uh that you can learn from and kind of push each other to go forward someone that you're aspiring to beat and then someone that you're teaching it just is this perfect i guess triforce to getting better all the time. So if you need to create that in your own life, like who's the studio, who's the designer, who's the artist, who's the musician that you're aspiring to be, that you want to beat as like the champion, who are the people that you metaphorically or think about on your same level that you can use as friendly competition to push you? Because I think we both agree there's no such thing as like true competition, but you can have that friendly banter or, or pushing each other back and forth that you're so inspired. You're like, shit, look what they published. Look what they put out. And I now I have to go do something. I have to create and make and one up them. I think we all naturally do this because we're competitive kind of monkeys in that way. Exactly. Um, but I think that's like some some like beautiful ways to kind of use use like a healthy mindset around all of this stuff in order to make the the last thing I was going to say is I love what you're doing with your mentor, telling them to literally copy something because that forces us. It's like the 
it's almost like drawing fruit or or like doing still life sketches where you have to like learn from literally what's in front of you. You exactly. have to try to get it as precise as possible. And then that just gives us the hand or the the dexterity in a way to like create that, but create it in a way that's different or new because you're not going to just like put it out. Hey, here's what I did. It's like everyone's going to know you copied. So yeah, and that's, right. that's, yeah. yeah that's, that's very interesting because I mean, from from copying other people's stuff, you can actually learn a lot more than you can you, you probably know are aware because if, if because you're always copying the final product and that product has everything lined up i mean it's a it's the final product it's live and it's residing on some link it has its own piece of internet attached to it and it's like very um uh you can you know you can learn like typesetting layout colors art direction for the photos you can uh, you can learn storytelling sto storytelling you can uh, see how everybody is so how someone is interacting uh, trying to combine interactivity with that storytelling for for example yeah. and it's very like it's very uh, jam packed lesson that you can uh, you can actually be influenced by mm -hmm. and, uh, well usually we try to focus on one area for example typography or what i what i feel that needs to be worked on but as as somebody as i don't know is mentee the right word or something like that so if when your pupil for example is <laughs> they are like uh, progressing through time you can introduce some new lessons and new uh, concepts so uh, i try to tell people that okay you are designer but you are kind of the storyteller mm -hmm. you're person who needs to have authority uh over the content over the uh, the overall message yes you have your own goals yes you have a brief that you need to fulfill that's why we talk about the goals mainly and that not the actual particular methods that we are applying to achieve those goals but um it it makes more sense to have a lot more ownership that people believe uh, at the start of the at the start of their career that they have so for example a lot of uh, times that uh, when i started uh, we were provided with a copy from the client or mm. I these photos and uh, like, i would like to see them on the website and you just you know do your magic with them and try to do it as best as possible but basically you know you could do better you know you could you know try to make something up but the task was okay create something with this particular content and that's very difficult it's like like it's for me it's very it's it's simply impossible for me to, to do to do the right job with that because i mentioned before that with that you're creating holistic and complete experience and it needs to be somehow it needs to be created as such so for example when we uh present uh, for our clients uh, for example our direction phase which is basically an example of uh, one page or a bunch of uh, sections that can be uh like stacked onto the, a single page so they can feel like a page but it's not like a real page yeah uh, i try to you know uh, introduce some copies in there i try to introduce photography in there i try to introduce a uh, complete story into that uh because it, it is holistic experience. I want to use that look and feel to propagate that look and feel onto other pages, for example, for some corporate website or something like that. And I, I would like to transfer that, but only way that I can in, inspire the client is to provide them with a full picture. Mm. Yeah. So we, we used to do uh, wireframes and try to approve them with the clients, and that's kind of okay, it works, but. It's a hit and miss, more miss than a hit, because this is the old method. Like this was like five, six years ago, uh, when we tried to, okay, we have to structure this in a very predictable way and then, you know, put this out, uh, especially for the SaaS websites. Those are like very notoriously corporate. And, <laughs> yeah. And uh, what was funny, it was that nobody understood those wireframes. Nobody really understood those. And uh, we try, and I just I was just like okay let's do do a single page, and we will do everything copy storytelling we will do everything, 
and it will improve the photos, we'll do everything. And we will say, okay, I will present you this design. I will uh, provide the reasoning be be behind my decisions. I will provide how that aligns with your business goals, your brand, whatever. Uh, but also, it, this will inform also what you need from these services. For example, you need a photographer, you need 3D modeler, for example, person who would uh, model stuff. You will need, um, I don't know, expansion of your brand guidelines if they're not defined enough. Or uh, you will need uh, additional secondary typography that we can use on the website because this small set of fonts will work only on the postcards. And if we want to introduce some other style, uh, it's kind of hard uh, to use that. So we try to, you know, try to make that collaboration a little bit more uh, bi-directional and inspirational rather than just giving you know, tasks. And then that gives you a lot, a lot more freedom and it gives you ability to, to stand behind your work when you're presenting that. And it will get shut down, don't get me wrong. That's, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Unfortunately, that's the part of our job. Yeah. Is things will get shut down, but it's like every designer has a like, uh, you know how they say, I have a like a pool of ideas, but it's mm -hmm. not a, it's a river. So you, <laughs> you stop being so precious about your ideas. So let's come up with something else because you always have a new idea. And that's 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 the, the positivity and, you know, position you can take when you talk with clients uh, and their changes and everything else. So, yeah, I mean, definitely it's, I kind of lost track, of course. We're we're both those type of people who just like to to share and share and share and try. We try to uh, try to inspire your clients, and uh, or if you want to call them partners, let's call them yeah. partners now, uh, because that the relationship needs to be be directional. It has to be like true collaboration. Collaboration and client collaboration is so essential, and just having like open and honest communication. Is there anything in your process that you found extremely successful for maintaining good client relationships and fundamentally keeping things on track? Well, definitely, you know, you need to uh, make sure that you establish contact with the client on the first meeting, because as opposed to, for example, like sending your salesperson there or sending your uh, project manager manager there it's very essential for the designer to be included in those conversations and the same uh, same range true when i was freelancing for a brief time um uh, when you get to know the client and you you know what their goals are and everything else it, it's kind of the, the key point is to establish that certain amount of trust it doesn't yeah. have to be that's really difficult because you don't actually know them um, mm. and then and they'll from their perspective they hired the stranger that they see probably their work probably didn't research their portfolio or something like that but you're hiring some that like that random agency or the studio to do some work which you're not confident to to do and uh, i always try to you know um when we are establishing contact, we, you know, we get to know each other. We talked about goals. We perhaps uh, create a workshop or something like that. And that's what's, <clears throat> what is interesting in, in that regard, when you know something about their work mm. uh, and you're not seeing that from the layman perspective. And when you're able to ask questions that they haven't been able to ask themselves in regards to the new project website something like that that's for that for me is um it's a good method clear winner but you have to find that like that thing you know uh mm -hmm. when you when a client comments oh well we didn't think about this <laughs> and it's a large company everybody's thinking about everything but yeah, we didn't we didn't think about this very much, and then they were like, they're, they're silently nodding, nodding, and you're silently nodding, and you know, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> let's let's work on that. Let's marinate on that. And uh, this this is the moment when you can see that uh, you can you know establish the trust, and all the collaboration can go a lot smoother from there. Of course, you can always charm them. You can always show your personality. I mean, you can uh, you probably see that. 
we have uh, all kinds of random bullshit on our website currently that is uh, weird, funny, um, doesn't translate to English, but nobody cares. <laughs> um, uh, weird jokes, uh, culture and everything else. And when people hear that and they, they see that, uh, you already have like, I don't know, I won't say a head start, but mm. they get a, a good idea who they're working with and uh, like it's like a half of handshake basically uh, the yeah. of the relationship it won't do it won't take you all the way but present yourself in an authentic manner it's very very important people people buy from people people are not buying services yeah that, uh, that thing they want to uh work with someone somebody who trusts and uh, fortunately, it doesn't have to cor correlate with your skills as a designer, which is kind of unfortunate. But once you realize this, um, and you're having decent uh, communication skills, that can be very fruitful for you. So, yeah, you try you try to get to know your clients as much as possible. Of course, if you have a project that came through a recommendation or something like that, that's like have job done. Of yeah. course. Um, which is kind of funny story because we have a we have a client now, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, we're in a talks with a PR person that was uh, that is that in that company. Uh, she's a marketing uh, head of marketing or the marketing team uh, person, and uh, she used to work uh, in Borofite, which is kind of funny. And and like, oh hello hello there uh, we like it's like instant family like that's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, he knows our culture and everything. I mean, that's not the ideal case, but it's kind of funny because you can say to those people like everything. It's like working for a friend, except they give you a lot of money. So that's cool. <laughs> so even better. <laughs> yeah, even better. No, and, no downsides for this. <laughs> no. And you were in a position where you were leading small teams and you transitioned into a role that was mainly craft focused mm -hmm. can you talk about what that transition was like and and how that pivot went for you and and maybe what sort of levels of joy it gave you to reconnect with craft and the making of of digital products and sites right right yeah that was uh that was uh very eventful for for uh my career as you could you could probably imagine but um when i joined the company if you uh, when you go through those roles you become for example middle senior junior whatever it's, it's not like it's not like that important but uh, uh our natural progression was to um become a lead which is which was not something that uh was necessarily attractive to me but it was uh, like a, a ladder up in your career because Yes, we did have like, um, let's call this a management track and you have a specialist track uh, where you can actually be on the same level, but you have like different things. But we all this kind of, uh, we all this kind of were like biased towards that management part. And I ended up having a, a team and also I had a, I had a head of design about my, my, my uh, position. And uh, yes, at certain point, it's a very uh, uh, like it's very dynamic experience because I transition from the maker to the oh, let's call this a minute, middle management position, which is basically a design lead. And I uh, lead, I led uh, at that time four designers, something like that. And then uh, and that was like very nice because I also had the support from my um, from my mentor, which is also. Uh, head of design and uh, that was kind of a cool experience for me and uh, I always had this I don't know um, I'm an introverted person but I'm not introverted when uh, when we are talking about design when we're talking about these things here and you know and uh, it was kind of cool to lead people who are in different position different skill set and uh, trying to enrichment uh, enrich them to become better Basically, mm. in everything, in not just design skills and everything. And uh, our, our role basically 
and it was not just me, but we have like many leads from different uh, different departments. Uh, at certain point, uh, it was kind of you know it became uh, very split between my craft. I I, would, I was doing the craft craft either way, but I was also uh, having to spend a lot of time uh, to you know lead a team to make yeah. sure that we have uh, regular check-ins. Uh, we used to call this quality times with our team members when we try to basically you know see what's up uh, no particular agenda if they want to you know talk about their uh, career progression or uh, personal problems for example so uh, it's like very like it's an older brother role basically yeah, yeah, yeah. You no know? and uh it's it was kind of cool but it ended up spending a lot of time and uh, at certain point what happened is that my uh, uh, my mentor and uh, head of design he left the company. Uh, he went independent, and uh, me and my uh, other uh, colleague, uh, she's uh, she was also uh, the design team lead. She was uh, specialized for the products and uh, uh, and the you know mobile applications. I was uh, working on the web design team. And uh, basically, what happened then uh, is it really showed that uh, support. Uh, it, I, I was kind of missing that support a lot, and uh, and, it, and not just me. That uh, it whole team actually felt this because uh, I don't know if I can name it, but Mario Mario Shestak actually he's a mentor. Shout out Mario! You, you, I learned a lot, uh, but. It was kind of cool uh, to, you know, stand on your, your own two feet, but in the same time, uh, that loss was felt even in my own team, uh, even though they weren't led by uh, Mario. So it mm -hmm. by me, yeah, we share the same name, so it's kind of confusing, but yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, and the, when you have that dynamic, uh, and you, when you have that, uh, so circumstance and just Corona just hit in the same time. So we had to you know adjust our workflow and have to, we had to you know organize some protocols uh, from work at home because mainly we were on site um, company back then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I felt that there was a certain mistrust forming in the, in the team, and I'm really totally honest here uh, because. Um, yeah, people lost a little bit sense of directions. So I had to put a lot of extra effort to make sure that team is stable. Yeah. And I had to change my leadership style a bit because I decided that I couldn't afford anymore to uh, babysit them in a, in a way. Uh, it's a little bit extreme, not like expression, but kind of is like babysitting. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you want to rely of, on, on the person to be self-sufficient and be a professional that you can uh, count on, they have to, you know, be um, not just, uh, they have to be senior, not just in uh, like their skill set, but have to kind of grow up a little bit to, you know, that. And then we, I, I realized that I haven't enabled them to grow up in that regard. Uh, so that was kind of, you know, um, not ideal situations, but I have to, I had to, you know, put them to make their own mistakes and let them go a little bit, try to correct stuff, try to, you know, create a control sandbox for people to fail. And that was very stressful for me because, you know, some people see that as a learning process. Some people don't, and some people just you won't you cannot give again trust for them because you were you weren't having their trust to begin with and that was that was kind of the thing because you know when you have like that very strong personality such as my uh, my lead uh, my uh, my mentor then you have to kind of fill up those shoes and uh, and uh, when you have like culture that was revolving around, around that we have to like refactor a, a lot of, of that culture to make sure that people are empowered to seek their own path, to try to find their own uh, style, uh, their own way of thinking. And I think that uh, over time, that kind of became true. You know, it was very stressful pro process, but in the, in the, in the time, that became true. Um, 
so yeah and uh there were uh like um people were leaving the company not just in design team because when you uh, lose uh, that that kind of person which is very influential some of the people just look up too much to that person or 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 whatever they they see that they uh, uh, they have some needs that they're not met anymore and they leave the company which i cannot blame you for that that's perfectly fine uh funny story uh and also cool story uh some of the people went back uh which is kind of cool because that that is a testament to that culture that yeah well even though we kind of refactor that it remained the same in principle like in the same in the principle of creativity in the principle of showing not telling in the principle of, of self-initiation and you know initiative sorry and uh, everything else so it became like uh proper dna for each and everyone in everyone mm -hmm. and um uh, since we at that time uh studio wasn't form uh, formally existing at that time at that time so it wasn't its own company but it became clear when we um split into our own little studio uh we tried to make sure that we don't carry the legacy of the large company structure meaning a lot of leads uh, several layers of decision making whatnot it's a studio okay so yeah. yes yes studios or agencies you know, mainly agencies they have dialect they have the, their hierarchy and then we're still working out whether we need that hierarchy in design general consensus is yes but i think that we're doing fine as it is somebody will want to not necessarily agree with me, but that's my opinion as of now. Uh, but then again, uh, it's kind of you know cool because you shared that that way. And I and I remember when we split up uh, to that we we spun out into that new company, Bonafide Studio. Uh, I have uh, like um, I mean he's my uh, he's my friend, but also he's my boss. And uh, he was talking with uh, he uh, he was talking with leaders in the former leaders in the in the company and uh, he questioned me in terms of okay uh do you even want to continue this role and that that came from him and i just instinctively right on the spot said no no and that and that but i wasn't planning for this i wasn't like i didn't know exactly what it implied but my instinctive instinctive answer was no because I want to return to the craft a little bit more. I want to uh, make sure that I manage my stress levels in a, in a proper way. It, yes, this can be a very fulfilling job to be a lead or something, uh, be a creative director, hire people. Uh, but then again, it can be time consuming. It can be, um, it can be ungrateful type of work because you're doing a lot, of, a lot of things in the background that nobody will probably see or appreciate. And not that, not that I actually needed that, but it's it's kind of you know, it's like your overhead. As a, mm -hmm. in addition to all other uh, obligations you have, that kind of can you know be the job that you know spilled over. And uh, I just said no, and I'm, I'm I'm not sure what that means. And he said, okay, uh, cool, cool, that's nice. And my colleague, who was also the lead, he was also his uh, front end developer uh, uh, lead. He also said, "No, no, 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 not really." <laughs> so <laughs> we just, just we shared that structure out really quickly, really quick, and um, we uh, specialized in our roles, uh, which do evolve over time. I mean, you kind of as a, a designer who is lo the longest in the company at current point. You do have a uh, uh, that old, older brother vibe that uh, mm -hmm. somebody is, you know. So low key, you're still trying to you know mentor them, and still, but basically they are equal now to me, and uh, that's kind of cool because uh, as a leader, depending on your style, but you can be more authentic that way uh, because you're not you're not sign, you're not signing their paychecks and everything. You're not negotiating <laughs> uh, on the serious stuff. I mean. Yes, you can get to know each each other in terms of okay, uh, what's happening at home, what's what's not. But we can do this over the you know the beer. Let's go for a drink and you know yeah. mingle and that. But yeah, and and I kind of 
transitioned it. Uh, so that was unplanned, really unplanned. And I transitioned into this maker role, which is basically my current role right now. So senior designer, um, maybe maybe it's time to shed that senior stuff because we don't have that many levels, we're just designers. But uh, what is what is kind of important is we flatten our structure a little bit uh, so it can be more nimble and we can be actual studio, which is not large. And it can be very, um, unstructured to facilitate that creativity in a way so yeah that's kind of cool so that that's kind of my story it's like it's very real story it's not like um not not it's not ideal uh very stressful it was very stressful i even uh, attended uh, uh to some coaching uh to help me deal with that because um uh, it's like a gym for your head you have to do it because yeah. When you put yourself in an extreme situation mentally, you have to take care of your mental health also. Uh, and um, I have a psychologist, which was very helpful for me. Uh, you do some exercises, you do some, uh, you know, you try to build up, you know, you stop comparing yourself, for example. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, a, that's the key lesson and everything. But uh, since then, uh i'm so fucking free i i can i can mm -hmm. you know in describe this and i'm within my credit i'm working in a smaller team uh we're doing uh i mean we're doing a like really decent job uh we're doing uh we having we are having our own setup we have autonomy something that we kind of always wanted um within the constraints of larger company, we still managed to get that autonomy, which is kind of nice because you can apply same procedures for the large company and for the studio, which is not even the product which works for clients, totally different model. So that that was kind of, you know, um, the, the my road to uh, from maker to maker. Basically. <laughs> Definitely, I mean, you did the unthinkable, you, uh, you not, well, you didn't downshift, but you followed your heart and your head and listened to your, I guess at that point, um, senior and and just did what you knew was best for you in transitioning to that role. And I think that's important because I think a lot of people care a lot about their job title. And it's not so much about the title as much as do you feel fulfilled in what you're doing? And do you want to be taking on that extra level of leadership in in your everyday job? I mean, I think a lot of people are they're trying to get to that point, but it could be that they are working towards something that they don't even actually want. So why handcuff yourself in that way? Just if you want to sit in a not a cubicle, but in your office or your room and design all day and not talk to anyone, then maybe that that's what you should shoot for. Maybe not talk to anyone, but you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's just being a painter in like the countryside of europe and <laughs> but um i think that is a very admirable and important message to get across because you should only work to a level that you want to be and yeah. not be forced into it if that's not your desire yeah yeah i remember um one saying that Basically, I don't know who actually said it, so I will try to uh, translate it in English. Uh, but basically, on your deathbed, nobody will, you know, remember how how, mu how much time they spend working on some project or something like that. You will care for something else. Yeah. You care for your friends, your family, whether you're alone or not. Uh, you will have regrets about things that... <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's it's very really real, but you will have regrets, you know, and um, just make sure that those regrets are not something that is very like fundamental to your yeah. life. And uh, I, and yeah, that is a risky move, and I totally understand that not everybody is in position to do that uh, mm -hmm. because, for example, we had the privilege to have a specialist track or path to you know specialization or something like that. A lot of companies don't do that, but then again, um, and the flexibility is always a cool thing, and it's a cool experience. And you know, 
as you make a lot of projects and if you with that you have some kind of leadership experience mm -hmm. and you have kind of mentorship experience that all the, everything that helps you in so subtle ways and it, it can make you very uh, happy happy and proficient person and everything you, you, you put your mind, mind to and uh, it's not it's not all sunshine and roses we do face some difficult times and i especially with uh with uh you know the economy these days and not just in the united, in the united states but in general we have like huge shakeups. Uh, people overinvested in covid and now uh that overcorrects itself so pendulum is swinging all over the place um but if you're like if you don't regret your decisions if you actually follow your heart then you can actually focus on what's really important and advance your for example financial situation but doing the thing you love because you have yeah. infinitely, uh, infinitely more resources to um be better in that way rather than you know being a manager not saying the manager is being a bad is bad it's a bad thing people who are uh being managers uh, from some specialist roles can be really proficient in that and they can find this really fulfilling not judging those people mm -hmm. again uh when i have to, had to pick between you know, craft and people <laughs> i chose craft <laughs> <laughs> i can't say that i blame you <laughs> let's shift from a more serious topic into some fast fun related or, or fast fun questions okay <laughs> maybe this is actually just turning into a therapy session but tell me about your youtube addiction yeah i have this weird obsession uh i did some tests i have a personality type that likes to uh, likes to hoard the information <laughs> weird weird and funny information uh about pretty much you know anything um uh, everything that i was interested in at certain point in time i was always my go-to method is to learn about it using the YouTube. Mm. And, uh, it's a funny example because, for example, I need to fix something in my in my in my uh, apartment, and uh, I just you know we we're just we were just arranging uh, my wife and I uh, the the bathroom, and uh, it was kind of funny because okay, how can I isolate this so water doesn't come up from the uh, for example. Uh, uh bathtub or something like that and i learned the tutorial i learned the, all the pro tech the pro tips and i was like within a 15 minutes i knew everything about this about the types of silicon about the tools that you need to use about editing whether you should use soap or your finger to make sure that uh, like those uh like grooves are nice and uh, nice and tight uh, watertight and it was like weird obsession because I just continue to do this. I I, I have like really weird, um, I don't know, hunger for the random knowledge. Sometimes <laughs> I get I get I get fed up with uh, okay design this typography that what whatever. But uh, again, um, uh, when I find out something really random, that kind of fulfills me. I just I I'm uh, like very uh, very avid. Uh, like I like to watch streams of other people playing games. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll, and, I'll, and that's really legit because we have all platforms for that. But for example, I'm playing a game, for example, and I want to get better this game, and I just do the tutorials again and again, and see some 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 person who is doing this and is best in the world and something mm -hmm. like that. Like really weird obsessions. Geo this and geopolitics tools home improvement uh car maintenance uh, uh really weird i just I, the other day i just google schematics for the star trek voyager the, like the, the ship <laughs> yeah yeah but to make sure if does does that make sense i mean and uh it was like really really random so it's not just necessarily youtube but like, well what did you learn from the schematics uh, I learned from the schematics that uh, they have like the very, it's very surprising how well they have like made this happen. Oh, uh, because of, you know, uh, it has a logic. So basically if certain parts of the uh, ship uh, doesn't have uh, 
does have a turbo lift which goes from one place to another you you can actually find out it doesn't go up and down but it does also the mm. sidewalk stuff and st stuff like that you can see where the bridge is you can see where the engineering is where, where the sick bay is and everything else and uh and i can see that even though they have like high uh fidelity schematics for the ship you can see that uh when they uh, recorded the show they reused the, the same follow again and again yeah and I, see, I see like it's like they're very different camera i mean that was, wasn't like a high budget show i mean it was a decent budget for that time i imagine but it's like very funny how they actually adapted to that uh, but yeah definitely i just, just go around google random stuff i mean it's like it's like very it's very weird and i just sometimes i can you know drive my wife crazy because i yeah i stick I, when i stick to one topic i really stick to one topic i mean like weeks of videos all there is to know about this people so yeah that's that's kind of you know not very healthy not very healthy but yeah <laughs> it could it's not unhealthy i suppose i i yeah, think it's, it's a, love, a love of learning and an interest in things outside of just design i'd say that's probably pretty healthy having yeah. interests outside of design like yeah. uh, fitness for one that's very healthy but uh it sounds like car maintenance not just gaming streams but what what <laughs> games are you uh watching streamers in in particular uh lately i'm uh, working through uh batman arkham knight mm. they have like uh i i cannot even perceive how difficult this game was to make because they have like a, a fighting system that basically Whenever you have a fight with uh, with uh, your opponent, basically it, it it's it's always different. It ha they mm -hmm. have like that this free flow fight when you actually can you know chain your hits between multiple enemies and it becomes like a sort of dance a rhythm game or something like that. And it has a very uh, large depth to it. Oh and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, and I uh, and I you know I do fine. I mean I'm going through the campaign and going through the story. I do do, do just fine, and I see some uh, some maniac on a YouTube who doesn't get he doesn't get hit for 15 minutes. He's taken out like the 300 people. He beat them all up. What? I get hit every few seconds, and it's insane. Like it's like very amazing uh, how how that is like how that is cool and how how can you actually go through that? And also, I drive a little bit. Uh, Gran Turismo is my jam. Yeah. Bought a wheel and a wheel stand. Just and I uh, or the vehicle I set it up in front of my TV. I drive a little bit. <laughs> That's kind of you know it's and it's a cool experience because it's not like joystick and everything. Yeah, it's physical. And I get so sweaty, man. And when you, especially when you're doing endurance, like let's do 50 laps. It's like you're a professional driver now, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> it sounds like you're a big sci-fi lover, not just Star Trek, but uh, in general. Is there any movie, book, game that has changed your life for the better? The, the reason I'm rewatching Star Trek Voyager is for that same reason, because it, it was like the first Star Trek show that I watched. I know that it was an enterprise before that and everything else. I watched everything, but Voyager was the, the thing because they have like the crazy storytelling and everything. I also, obviously, I, I uh, also watched the, the, the Star Wars. Uh, I found it really difficult to, to get into their role because the way they re re release those movies, like they're so like out of order and so like weird. So it's kind of hard to know try the story, which I'm sure it's very deep, but not not too much deep into that. I have to mention the Dune, which mm. is current stuff. Uh, amazing filmmaking, amazing story, amazing photography. If you haven't seen Dune, go see it. See the first part. There is there are two parts. First is like few years old if i'm not mistaken if you ever seen the expanse the, the, the yeah show. that's actually my favorite sci-fi i guess like property or ip at the moment but i do really like the show and my dad really loves the books he's i think he's read them all at this point yeah 
Yeah, it has it has a like very crazy setting, which is based on our reality, but not quite. Yeah, and it kind of makes you, I know, connect with that a little bit more easier, which is kind it's of cool. Extreme cool. like geopolitics and and interesting like power dynamics between Earth, Mars, and the outer planets that are all colonized. <laughs> Super was- cool. Yeah, I would recommend that show to anyone if they were interested in like some sort of sci-fi but i mean like even if you're not into sci-fi i think you could get into that show because there's good like leadership figures uh crew is super cool they're all good actors yeah yeah and that's that's for the for the shows and movies as for the games oh there's like so many of them but basically um I was really, uh, really avid freelancer fan. I don't know if you ever played freelancer. No, I haven't played that one. It's like a, uh, like a dog fighting game, but it has like story and you are some kind of mercenary that goes through space. And, but it's, it has a really, uh, really good, um, I don't know how to call this a very good storytelling part where you actually evolve your ship over time and you buy some new stuff, but you can actually manage those systems and you, it has a little bit of depth into that whole mm-hmm. RTD and everything else. So I like the, I like things that have a little bit of the learning curve in general. At, at this point in time, I like to ask if there's any final thoughts, words of wisdom, encouragement that you would like to give to the audience, any promos out there that you have and want to point people to, social media, uh we we can condense all this podcast into i don't know a few few key advice you should probably uh take a good hard look at yourself and where you have in your career and uh try to make sure that you're satisfied with your direction or career or, or whatever um and if you have to make some decisions to change to change that go do them. I mean, be smart about this, try to work out some kind of strategy, but try to be uh, try to be true to yourself because believe me, it pays off. It will, you will be truly happy for that. Um, also, you know, uh, play games, work out and, you know, uh, make sure that real work is fun. Yeah, that's a, that's a huge takeaway. It's just like making sure that you're having fun while you're working and just doing whatever it takes to make sure that you're maintaining that peace of mind and fun disposition because our work is fun yeah 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 and everybody is like everybody from the outside it looks that our job is fun we you know we go desensitized to that a little bit because um we're just always in our deadlines and everything but the point is you become designer you became designer for a reason mm-hmm. and you also uh you're spending a lot of time in, in doing what you do and mm-hmm. there's all like it's nonsensical to be miserable, miserable. <laughs> so i mean you have to face it. i know it's, it's i know it's kind of selfish i mean you have to and no, no not everybody's but you should strive for that a couple of big things and i tried to summarize your your methodology here mario for for creating really great work so i have forget the brief kind of turn off your brain experiment and have fun while you're working power through when when it's not fun or go for a walk play some games do something that you enjoy and then practice 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 and make as much as possible would you say that that's accurate yeah, definitely. You you did it better than I would. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes, the uh, the, the pure method there. But uh, to the audience, remember that we are all legendary and we have an amazing story of our own to share. So on the journey, take the time to be kind, to grind and unwind. That's the essential step. And let's make the world a better and more creative place to live together, one day at a time. Mario, thank you so much for being here. I mean, this has been a blast. Could have chatted yeah. about movies in the expanse for hours. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was uh, it was a real blast. And two hours when they flew by. They really did. Yeah, man, yeah. it's been just so much fun. So thank you again.